Anthony Darby. Chuck Hen. We are live here with Phil Ash and the High Five Initiative. Thank you so much for coming, Phil. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, for those folks uh, who may be unfamiliar, can you explain the High Five Initiative and, um, and what you guys are all about? Oof. Yes. The High <laughs> Five Initiative uh, is a local nonprofit that we started, uh, my partner and I and a couple other people, uh, as an environmental nonprofit. Um, one of the programs that we run is a recycling program. It's sort of a recycling program, but it's more or less a landfill diversion kind of program. Um, and that came into fruition, uh, you know, uh, and sort of aligned with the cannabis industry. And, and you know, that's, that's why it touches on this. And the five, um, as I see it in your logo, so yeah. plastic is typically given a number and a letter or just a number assignment? Um, so the, a lot of times I look at the, the letters. The letters typically are just shorthand for different uh, uh, plastic compounds, molecules. Um, so like polypropylene is normally short, or PP is normally shorthand for polypropylene, HDPE for high density polyethylene, things like that. Uh, but the numbers are sort of like a standardization of, of categories. Um, the idea for recycling, if you can think about it, I mean, most people look at recycling and they, they have an idea of what happens, um, and then they remember the symbol. Um, but this, start, this particular recycling was just really pushed, uh, I think somewhere in you know, 60s, 70s or something like that. Um, and the idea was to take care of our waste. And so there's three sort of arrows in a recycling symbol. The first part, uh, basically, it's, it's symbolic of what the steps are. So it's supposed to be circular. So you have materials that you make stuff out of, and then when you're, you use them, and then you're done with them, you're supposed to then collect them. And then you separate the materials into different sort of categories. Um, and then those, that's, that's the first part of the recycling. Then you hand that off to so the collection and the sorting and the cleaning and the prep of this this material then you hand that off to a manufacturer who makes something out of those raw materials and then the, the last part is when consumers buy a new a new item that's made out of the, the those materials and it's basically to because you have materials you use them up it's it's to minimize your waste um, but yeah so for plastic it's the same idea um, uh, you know, they have one, two. That five is a specific type of plastic. Yeah, though, the correct? five that we're talking about is polypropylene. Yep. And and that is <clears throat> not something that can be typically thrown into <clears throat> like your household recycling bin that's for pickup, correct? Uh, it depends. So in every county, uh, so what we're talking about is single stream recycling now. So you, you're you familiar with the blue bins, yep. in, like it, most people have, and you can put them by your curbside and then... That's, so you put everything in that blue bin, and that's why they call it a single stream. Um, but what happens with the, the sort of, you know, the trail of what happens with that material is it, it, gets, it gets sorted a little bit, and then it, you know, sometimes they'll go to a, a local facility first. And they take off cardboard or something like that sometimes. Um, and then it gets put in a roll-off and then goes all the way to um, a facility, which is sort of like Willy Wonka-esque. It's a... They call them a material recovery facility, MRF. Um, and this is that thing in your mind where you think it's sorting lots of different um, conveyor belts and, and grinders and stuff like that. Excuse me. Um, but we're talking about, especially in the cannabis packaging, um, is just this little thing here. So what ends up happening in these, uh, these sorting facilities is they get a final product, but it has like a little bit of contamination from other things in it. So when you're going through these massive machines, maybe it gets a little oil, maybe it gets a little different uh, plastic in it, maybe it gets a little number one, whatever. That's a contamination uh, content. So, you know, it, overall mass, that's a little piece of contamination. And that's an actual parameter or a specification on that raw material for the manufacturer that's gonna buy it, right? So, um, you know, when we started, you know, America and everybody started to recycle, everybody had a couple of different ideas. They'll do dual streams, so you can imagine where they'll separate paper, maybe they'll separate 
glass and paper and then no key plastics um are all the plastics always in one category as I far as recycling yeah as far as recycling no. goes okay no no and in fact uh for this particular plastic this number five plastic um any amount so you can imagine it's got to get ground down cleaned up and it's now these little pelletized things of number five polypropylene plastic so it has inherent material properties that you use this plastic for so it has it's bendable in a certain way it's very um has low surface energy when you make stuff out of it it's you know really chemically resistant and stuff like that and, it, and you can get it really hot there's a couple of cool things but it's not any different than anything else but if you put a little bit of number two plastic in it none of those things work anymore so it actually interrupts the 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 molecular chains on the cure when they're actually making a new thing out of it so now they can't make a new thing out of it so now it's just waste instead of recyclable material Well, yeah i mean there's a couple of ways you can do it so you can process it again uh, and you can try to remove a couple of different things and do a bunch of different chemical processes uh, or you can burn stuff off and and it basically causes a really bad environmental thing when there's this, this contamination in the product, right? So forever, we haven't, America, well, actually every country, didn't do anything with their material. They created a, sort of a system in this single stream where we take the material, we get it to one of these sorters, they break it down into that, that material, and they have a sort of standardized contamination rate. You know, our machines can make polypropylene with 7% contamination, right? Um, and then what happens to that material? Well, it turns out that 72% of the world ship their material to one place. China. China. China, right? Now, China, if you remember, and, you know, people think, oh, whatever about China. But if you remember back in, like, the 2010s and whatever, it, what you saw on the news was an environmental catastrophe over there. You saw people with SARS masks. You saw, like, they called it the worst environmental whatever in the world, blah, 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 blah. You're seeing pictures like Beijing and just be covered in smog. Terrible and just, air yeah. quality, terrible <coughs> poisoning, just terrible stuff. Well, they stopped. And in 2013, they put in an actual parameter. Um, the way, the reason, one of the reasons they were getting sick burning is because they were burning all that plastic. plastic. They do it all in the same yeah. building. They'll have like a manufacturer of rubber here, uh, uh, a different guy, and a dentist over here. It's the craziest thing. <laughs> yeah, I've been to China. I it's, um, it's not. I really have, and it is, um, it is, it is crazy. So I mean, it's beautiful, but yeah. that part wasn't working for them. So they put in, you know, a political thing, and and it was called the, the I think it's called the green fence, and all it did was sort of change the parameter on that contamination, so that their manufacturing didn't have to do so much to clean it. You know, you're taking other people's waste. You, know, you sort of got a feel for this. Yeah. So then uh, that didn't really change anything because all of our machines could still make it to the parameter that they needed. So they doubled down. And in 2017, they pulled out the national sword policy, which basically lowered that contamination rate to a rate that no one could achieve. So what do you do when that happens? Um, and what we... what you know, we did as a society or as that, that sort of, that industry, what they did was, you know, find out immediately uh, that they had all their eggs in one basket. That's not good. Sales eggs in one basket's not good. No. You got to no diversify. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because if that guy <clears throat> says no. And just real quick, like from a local perspective, it's always interesting to understand how much like international politics mm. ha- um affects local politics and and how much does a decision in china to change how they accept the recycling protocol affect salisbury i saw our mayor getting lit up by a citizen one day about how come salisbury's recycling program is not as robust as it was just three or four years ago and that's when i was quickly educated our our mayor is very quick to, to respond um and and very poignant oftentimes and he went through this long thing about how with the recycling stuff with china it changed everything and now things have to be sorted differently and there's yep. just a higher level standard of due diligence pre sending sure. in everything so it all ties in exactly what you're saying yeah and you know it goes out the ports and and so what ended up happening was you know these these sorting centers needed they, they sort of started to stack up and the first thing they did was try and get a different buyer so they went to a bunch of different countries 
um, who became quickly overwhelmed. I mean, if you move 72% yes, into of, your Of the your world's waste, right? And when yeah, you're ready for crazy. 10%, you're going to get swamped and it's not going to work. Um, and that happened. Uh, they did it with, you know, India, Vietnam, Malaysia. It's just crazy. Um, so then they get stacked up again. And you only have so much real estate at one of your businesses, so what do they got to do? They had to do something with the material. They got to make a hard decision. You only have a couple of different options at that point. Um, and I would imagine, you know, everybody does different things. Some of them are shipping to different locations that may be able to do that. Maybe they have different environmental controls there. Um, some of them are landfilling it. Um, some of them use it as top, like topping for their own landfills. So it's sort of like a weed suppressant, which is way None worse. None of this sounds great for my grandkids. Yeah. None of it's good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if you put it in the landfill, it doesn't ever break down. It's got like a thousand years, they say, but, um, you know, I'm not that old. So I don't know how you can perfectly, I mean, you can look at the rate of decay and believe that, but who knows? Um, then there's leachate that comes with it when you break it apart. Um, it's just a lot of bad. It's just not the right thing to do with them. Um, and plastic, it, you know, it doesn't biodegrade. It degrades, which means it breaks down into microplastics. That stuff, no matter where you're at, gets run into, you know. The ocean. It's going to go into the ocean. It's going to leachate. It's gonna, it just has bad, bad uh, feedback loops that are, that are, you know, for the life cycle. Um, so there's lots of, they're s sort of stuck, and they got to fix uh, this this thing. Now, I didn't know as much, obviously, as I know right now uh, when we first started this. Um, w you know, we were patients. Is that so real quick? I mean, were you guys just patients? Yeah. And all of a sudden, you realize that every time you're buying an eighth, uh, you're getting this typically green or black pop top container. Absolutely. And you're a socially conscious person at home, and you're saying, well, this, you know, I know where I can put my my recycle bowl when I have a milk container or something like that, but sure. I don't know what to do with all these things. And you've quickly realized that there wasn't a, a place for them. Is that what happened? Uh, I was educated on the fact that there wasn't a place for them, but yes, that's, uh, that's basically what the, the, the were you an early patient in a program? I mean, like real quick, was there a, if you want to get into any of that, I mean, you can get into whatever you want. So were you an early patient in the program? And well, I don't know what an early patient is. But so the program started in 2017. I was a patient before they called it patient, if that makes any sense. So yes, I would I would be an early adopter Excellent. for the medical program. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and um, <laughs> there's not a cop waiting to jump out to say he spoke lead before it's legal. Um, no, nah, yeah, for sure. And uh, and what was your have you had, have you always been um, socially involved in the environment and environmental impact of you? Yeah, so uh, as far as me personally, I mean, uh, each one of us on the board has a different sort of background with, with environmental stuff, right? Um, but my personal background with environmental everything is that the way I learn um, is different than other people. So I learn visually, okay? So that, it makes it harder to do normal education stuff but observing and understanding visually like that you can learn a lot more and sort of use it as an analogous lesson in certain ways nature has always been able to teach me in that kind of way so anytime you grow a plant anytime you are, are in nature all of that has 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 been really sort of a biomimicry education uh, for me um, then, you know, I had a lot of influence from my own family who, you know, my, my grandmother, she went to Japan and, and learned the art of bonsai and stuff like that and brought back and taught us and stuff like that. So lots and lots of different, uh, every time anything has ever been good, it came from nature. Anytime we try to do something, it makes it a little harder. And it's sort of this, uh, when you want to go and find the actual answers, you get back to nature. So I'm an environmentalist at heart. Um, we try to, my partner and I, my fiance and I, we, we try to uh, be zero, like you said, zero waste at home. Um, I, you know, I make, I up, uh, what do they call it? I recycle everything. So I, I make 
I forget. Well, I'm trying to figure out what they call the art that, you know, upcycled uh, art. Thank you. Uh, I mean, upcycle art. Yeah. 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 So any, we do lots of different things. Like we kayak and stuff like that. And then we'll go do a full cleanup while we're kayaking or if we're, we're hiking, it's, you know, we bring the dog and then we go clean up the entire stuff. And then you have this stuff. What do you do with it? Can you make something out of it? Is it waste? That's always a question of mine. Um, in nature, there isn't waste, but we yeah, everything's have, got a purpose, right? It like has a purpose, when the branch yeah. falls from the ground, it doesn't just it, stay there. It decomposes. Someone's eating it, turns into dirt. Sure, yeah, plants. it's a full cycle, um, and that's what's not happening with plastic. Every time we would go out on a kayak trip or anything like that, the things that would be left over that nature couldn't make use of um, was man-made things, uh, rubber, uh, you know, molecular things that just didn't degrade. Um, so rubber foil, uh, you know, Doritos stuff and, and, and styrofoam and plastic was the only thing that would be left no matter as you, there was no people, but there would be a tire or six for no reason in the middle of an Island or something like that. So we would have to try and clean that up and figure out different ways and different things to do with that. Um, when I was, you know, I've had lots of different jobs and things in nature. Uh, like I talked to you guys earlier, I, you know, I've been uh, a master grower in a greenhouse operation. I own my own landscaping company. I stopped doing all of that. Um, and then I worked at a manufacturing company um, making rubber. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, I know... I'm, I, I understand both the science and I understand the, the natural side of things. Um, and I can tell you that it's, it is, it's a big, as, oh, excuse me, it's a big problem. Oh, you can go. It's okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, you don't need to go out of your way to do it, but. All right, then I'm going right, to get loose now. There's <laughs> definitely worse ones to come out. You want to podcast. You don't need to make it a sport, but when they yeah. come out, they, they come, come out. out. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So I understand your. <laughs> I really think I had a good idea of your own kind of personal philosophy, and you mentioned that you were a patient early in the program. Yeah. So you're you're quickly noticing that it's not just the eighth containers, but like everything is. So we're yeah. The yeah. packaging. So the packaging issue. If you're not a patient, um, and you're not aware, like I can tell you that it, uh, I'm blown away. Starting with you know the state's going to require us to have two labels on every single piece of package. So that's two pieces of paper, mm. and then like a vape cartridge will typically come maybe in a box and then a plastic tube and then there's there's two pieces of of plastic style or a piece of plastic and rubber on both ends of them mm -hmm. and then for you know, a lightly boxed one i've seen a lot of cartridges i mean packaging whether we like it or not in business and the environment a lot of people look at the package itself and there's like this you look at there's it like as, this a differentiator, right? as a differentiator mm -hmm. and then you open it and there's this thing i mean you can people watch videos all day on youtube about unboxing of stuff and they look oh, at the yeah, packaging right yeah, I didn't even think so about like that. some of these packages that we have for these vape cards just like box 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 it's like how sure. many boxes <laughs> yeah. do you possibly need that's an industry for one yeah an industry in general industry. right right so so yeah i mean if you think about it on a like a really wide scale so maybe not as detailed as just the cannabis yeah. industry but every industry if you're a consumer or just a person and you just talk about going in and buying something you go in and you buy for for cannabis you go in and you buy medicine um, that's your intent as a consumer. You come out and you have medicine and a package and maybe a bag. And like you're saying, if it's dependent on the medicine, uh, maybe have seven different things that are extra. Um, and now you own that stuff. So you own the package. That's your responsibility, what to do with it. So that's where we were with it. Um, and what we found is as you, it, it's not just, you know, cannabis, it's everywhere you go, there's packaging regulations and prepackaging regulations. And what do you do with all that stuff? It's a big, big kind of crazy issue as to what is waste and what do you do with it? And is there infrastructure to take care of everybody's waste? I mean, people throw away a lot of stuff. No, I, it's you true. You know, do you need to? Is the question, and and it's you know it's odd. Like I, 
there's there is the Chuck's point. Like a lot of the packaging is very sophisticated, and intricate. Also, we have things like childproof, right? So whenever you add a safety mechanism like that, you're typically going to be more packaging. Um, and your your concept of people come in and they want to buy the medicine, but they they're forced to take the packaging with them, is like is a very very true statement. Many of our patients, um, without overgeneralizing, can I argue that cannabis patients may be more sensitive to health and environment concerns than the overall public? I'm just going to say that whether it's true or not, because I know that many I times, uh, many times our patients are bringing this direct conflict to us saying, hey, look, like, why is there so much trash? How can we recycle these things? You know, in my everyday life, I wouldn't expect to do this. I want the medicine, but I don't want all this this plastic. Yeah. And we're kind of stuck in a place where, you know, if you're a typical retail store owner of a, a convenience or grocery store, you can make sure that the Ziploc bags you have are made from 80% recycled materials. And you can make sure that the bottled water that you carry is made from recycled material, or maybe you only carry one style of single use bottled water and you have filling stations. But with us, we only have 15 vendors to choose from. Mm. There's only, there's limited numbers of, of, of medicine. There's, there's flower shortages. So like, Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of a beggars can't be choosers in our regulated environment that we don't have the same buying power in terms of I can't say unless you become more environmentally conscious in your packaging I'm only going to buy yep. X. So I think that that's why I guess we get to a bigger point. That's where I saw our responsibility um, in terms of the dispensary is if our patients are telling us that that they feel like there's an abundance of waste and plastic. Um, and I don't feel that the market uh, cultivar, cultivars and processors are going to handle that situation very soon. So if they're not going to address it right away, then how can, you know, what can I do? And then you present to, to without giving, you know, I guess to give you a pat on the back, um, oftentimes in our position, we can't do everything that we want to do. You have to prioritize. There's only so much time in the day. And people bring valid and good ideas to us all the time, and they go to die very quickly because they don't have SOPs or they don't have, like, the nuts and bolts. Or, like, they say, this is a good idea that you should go do. And I'm like, yeah, we have plenty of good ideas that we're trying to execute on. Like, I'm looking yeah. for someone that yeah. can come to us with a solution to help yeah. me out with my business. And when I asked you and, and reached out um, and you were very quick to say, yeah, this is, you know, some set of protocols. We've already worked with the MMCC. We've done a lot of the legwork. We can make this as, as simple for your business as possible. Like that was that was an amazing um, value proposition because I want to do what's good for the environment. I have someone that's enabling and helping me to do it. Mm-hmm. And my patients want this to be done. I don't think industry is solving it. So, like, this was a way that I can be part of the solution um, and not impact my business. Because at the end of the day, we all still have to serve patients and run a business. And when things are done that, that aren't feasible for that, typically they get, you know, put to the wayside. You've done a really great job. Mm-hmm. And I know that – who was your – who? so let's get into the program itself. So is Maryland the only state mm-hmm. that this exists in? Yeah. And who was the very first – um, was it a dispensary to be your first one uh-huh. to buy in? Who was that? Kip. 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 And um, did you have a relationship with them? Not Kip, no. Not at that point. And, um... No, I mean, we reached out, um... It was, like, a weird thing where I... We had... We didn't know what the response was going to be. So we didn't know when you're talking about on a business side. So I can we can talk however you want business metaphysics. It doesn't matter Um, when you're talking about this is you have to sell this idea because in the path what we're creating here. You know, when we first started this, we like you said, we were we were patients and we had a a similar response, uh, which was we have a lot of plastic and we don't know what to do with it. Then we found out and actually worked with the state to find out what was happening with the material to find out, you know, how big eventually come back around and work with the MMCC to find out how big the actual issue was. Um, and then to find out what needed to be done to check other options as far as is anybody else doing this? Is there an open sourcing? You know, did somebody fix this already? 
finding there wasn't any and then having to actually come back and create it, you guys as dispensaries are now part of the path to divert this material away from the landfills into a recycler. And that's exactly, you know, it's a necessary point in this process, right? So our nonprofit takes the material from you guys, your, your collections, and then does one process and then we transfer it to another processor that's also local within the state. So I'm not transferring anything outside of the state. It doesn't scare anybody. Were you not, was that something that you had to take into protocol to Absolutely. not transfer? Yeah. So like even sometimes, like we Absolutely. always talk, there's no interstate commerce and that goes for dirty weed containers too, right? It just, so it's not, it's not necessarily impossible to do. It becomes a different material when it's outside of, uh, you know, it's waste. It's a rigid number five plastic container. It doesn't matter where you put it. You're gonna put it somewhere. You know, you're going to put it in the blue bin. You're going to put it in it. It's Got their it. trash anyway. This, um, but it makes people nervous at the same time. So it's a risk protocol. Can you actually scale this to a secondary state? Or do you have to keep it in this? Depending on how you set it up, um, you know, you can scale it. But you have to work with a bunch of different, you're talking about, you know, things that make people nervous. Um, and, you know, Doing it correctly is very important. That's why we don't just stay with just the cannabis industry. We're a 501c3. We, you know, uh, you know, pharmacies, mom and pop pharmacies have the same stuff, right? So they have number five plastic that, that they can act. I mean, imagine how many pill bottles there are. Or almost all those amber pill yeah, bottles, right. number That's five. That's all number five. What else is number five? Yeah. Yeah. It's just a lot of different food items. So, like, if you go to the is it Chinese typically considered store, like a is that so is it is number five the, plastic brand is like a food safe? A lot of times it is plastic. Yeah. So that's typically why you would see it for pharmacy in, in our right. industry. And, and a lot and now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I know because traditionally, are you not allowed to if you have a number five waste container that contained food because it had food in there? Would that not? be able to be recycled absolutely like not now there's another company um in new york uh that we've you know when when we were doing the research to find out if anybody else does this I, there are analogous scenarios but most of those sort of material recovery and and then recycling and then material recovery and then recycling uh, stem from a manufacturer that is trying to do it so there's a manufacturer in new york that makes sense. Um, that actually sort of partnered. They're called. Their program is called Preserve, but they partnered with a, another company um, called uh, Stonyfield. Uh, makes yogurt. I oh, I can the, see their yeah, brand I've seen it in the store. I can see it in my head. So you yeah. see, the, the, so yeah. they make uh, now. They Preserve makes uh, you know uh, bowls and and uh, razors and out of recycled polypropylene, um, but. They got Stonyfield to um, actually change their original yogurt containers from a number six, which is absolutely not recyclable, to a number five. And then they worked with, um, what is that, that grocery store with the W? It's Whole Foods. They work with Whole Foods all across the country to set up collection centers for their consumers to bring back their empty, yogurt uh, hopefully cleaned yogurt containers and then when they drop off their their you know recycled you know doodads that they're selling they grab those things and can actually transport it back to their new york facility where they manufacture a new set so it's a closed loop it's beautiful um the you know that so it's it's a similar scenario and they can do that all across the world and it does so in that case the food um isn't you there are methods to treat it and and remove it it's not that hard actually so it costs a lot of money, but it's not hard. Um, you just got to think different about it. Yeah. So <clears throat> the process right now uh, for in Maryland for your initiative, right? Mm -hmm. um, dispensaries set up a container on site. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the responsibility is for the patients to be able to clean out that that container first, right? It's yeah, it's preferred. Do you find that, like, do you find it that most people follow the protocols or do you find that people, like, sometimes are lazy and, and like, is it? No. It's for nobody, the nobody, so, it, you know, on, on our, on our request, we, you know, there's, like, little uh, patient literature that actually help them, um, a, a patient, understand how to recycle, basically. You have this pop top, you want to empty it, it's sort of common sense. 
You want to empty it. You want to try and take your label off because it's got your information on it. Um, and you want to rinse it out. Um, and then you want to put it in the right receptacle that's actually going to recycle this stuff. Um, but let's say you're an old person or an older patient, maybe a younger, I don't know. And you have some, or maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you have some difficulty doing any one of those steps. Um, it's okay. As far as recycling rigid polypropylene or rigid number five containers, the processes that are used in recycling, they don't consider the cannabis uh, really, m you know, minute molecules that may still be in there to be anything other than waste. Um, and it's not preferred for the plastic, so we take it out. Um, it's, you know, not my process, but the next process has a full rinse and it's chlorinated and it's treated as wastewater. So it's not part of it is really the end for that. So I know that you're in Curio, right? Yeah. Who, where else are you guys? Uh, Chesicana? Uh, we are in Chesicana as well, yeah. Um, there is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant, but there's probably, uh, uh, I'm hoping a few more that are uh, more multi-state operators that are coming on as well. Excellent. The, the idea is to put as many paths out there for patients who would like to make that choice, um, you know, as spread out as possible so that people can. Yeah, so for our patients listening and saying, well, how come you guys aren't doing it? We, we certainly are in the process right now. It's, it's definitely one of our, um, our Q1 goals is to, is to get this rolling. And then certainly as we start looking at, you know, our, our new future home, we'll be looking at, at making sure that our new location is set up as well. Um, but I do think that, um, so what have been what have been some of your biggest hurdles as you've been trying to, is it, is it about just like getting the, 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 attention span of of uh, dispensary owners which is typically tough to do and i mean so it, uh, it's odd actually uh there's it's a it's an amazing learning experience um you know the first hurdles were you know you need to make a non-profit second hurdles were you know you need to make an a sustainable uh system that can actually accomplish this landfill diversion sort of path uh, third was you have to convince, obviously, every part of the path to be functional, and, and, and you come up with strange obstacles. Um, one of the obstacles that we come up with a lot is um, a sort of self-stigmatizing of this material, if that makes any sense, and I'll explain it a little bit more. A lot of people within the industry are more concerned with it being uh, part of the industry this packaging than the people outside of the industry and in the other area so uh, the transport businesses the the recycling businesses so there's they don't care so that was a big big thing just letting people know that it's not special because it's trash and it's cannabis trash right all right that was a big thing and uh then there was a lot of concern with getting people to understand that our state was um, actually really supportive of this. Um, and that was, you know, as far as being in the industry and having people understand the, that. the regulators. That is, yeah, sure. yeah, the, the regulatory fact that um, many folks. I mean, you present something like this. The first question our operations guy is going to ask me when sure. I say I want to get a recycling guys, program. Yeah, yeah. My, you know, my compliance guy is going to say, "Well, how's it work?" And I need to get approval from MMCC because. That's great. And, and it's great because it's, it's really great because you've done that. Yeah. And yeah. you've done that legwork. But um, it's a challenge in the fact that. It's a challenge. It, because for, you know what? Because yeah, you had to do regular, it, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes yeah, sure. it's not so easy to get a clear answer on like delivery vehicles. You know, uh, there's a huge change in the transportation of product in the state right now that has just been for the last 30 or so days. Um, am I wrong in that? About 30 days? Yeah. yeah. Right? Yes. And the things that we were doing every single week all of a sudden became, you can't do that. And, like, sometimes it feels like that can happen in the MMCC. Like, we, I think that it's gotten a lot better in terms of the communication. But sometimes it, even asking the MMCC to give you an answer for something that's outside the purview of your day-to-day -day operations can seem like a large task. So when, when I went to the operations, my operations guy, 
and say, hey, this is something that I want to do. And even though I'm his boss, he's still going to give me pushback. Sure. And, uh, but I say, no, they've talked to the MMCC, and I know the other dispensaries are doing it. It's almost like a gate comes down. It almost becomes yeah. like you immediately get, gain credibility because you're proving that you're doing it, right? So what were those yeah. conversations like? Who do you talk to? Do you talk to, like, the inspectors? Yeah. Uh, actually, when we first started uh, to – yeah, so that goes all the way back to, you know, just being patients, right? So we're patients, uh, and I've been a patient advocate. I've worked with the MMCC uh, before on different things. Um, but, uh, you know, it's always been a positive sort of uh, talk. You know, we made a sustainable packaging uh, option at one point for, for a, uh, a dispensary up near us. Um, and so, she, you know, they were familiar with us, I guess. Um, but we needed her help. Um, to sort of uh, understand. You mean Joy? No, not oh. Joy. No, oh. I needed uh, Lori. Lori, Lori's help. Lori got uh, to no Joy. Joy, I like Joy. <laughs> She's a G leaf now. She is yeah. a G leaf. Now. Uh, yeah, I like I like all of them. I don't know. We had an interesting meeting at one point, but um, I like all of them, and they've been relatively uh, straightforward. And Lori's been very good. Um, but I had just this one simple question, which was, uh, how big is this problem? And she was able to help us get to that point. Um, uh, and it's big. Yeah, our first measurement was somewhere around 84,000 pounds of polypropylene just in flower sales. So not, not joints or any yeah. uh, um, pre-rolls or any of that, uh, just flower. Uh, but it was like a shortened year. So it was so. just whatever, what, you know, it was March to December. Um, so then they just released the new uh, uh, December to December sales figures. And just for flowers, it's 154,000 pounds of plastic. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it just continues to scale. And it's not, you know, we talk about that. Uh, the thing about the cannabis industry and why we're focused on the cannabis industry is because a lot of those other industries um, uh, have either a solution that they could actually attain or um, have, like your vape scenario, just 17 versions of packaging in one, which make it a lot more difficult. To do it with just one package, this pop top, is a lot easier to minimize the contamination when you're actually rerouting it. So it actually turned out to be sort of serendipitous that this was just this one type of material that was very very commonly used and it was only used like that because you know one manufacturer came in at a ridiculously low rate that sort of met the the requirement of the so company. there wasn't this standard of these one single type of pop tops and there was if there was a hundred to different yeah, yeah it, your initiative would be str- yeah. would yeah. but luckily you could you could basically say okay just by addressing this one single container i can take a smack at a hundred yeah. something thousand pounds mm-hmm. of trash alone let alone That's maybe right. phase is so it's phase two phase three to look at at, at, stuff. at like what's next on a totem pole kind of deal as far as yeah as far as being able to do yeah it's how can so our goal is to sort of keep this stuff out of the the landfills and out of the waterways and and come up with a method to do it it turns out that we didn't it's not rocket science to create you know if you can see this path and you can just take one thing that's actually getting contaminated and move it before it gets contaminated it's not rocket it's not rocket science it's already being done um but it's a model or every MRF, or you know those those Willy Wonka stuff, they're losing extreme amounts of money. They're having to pollute everything. They're it's it's just not functional. The counties lose money doing this. Um, it's it's a bad scenario. So you got to look for as many solutions to try and help out everybody trying to deal with this as as a unit. Um, and that's sort of the idea. Can you do it with other things? Sure. Um, it's a model, really. Um, but yeah, when we take the plastics, right, there are four or five different versions of plastics that you have to deal with just in that. You get a curio um, pop top thing. It's got like the slide on the top. Yeah. Yep. So the bottom, and it doesn't say anything. The black top says, if you flip it inside out, it's say number four. But the bottom of it is a mold mark. It's just a number. Um, so when they actually make the thing, they have a lot of different cavities in this big steel mold. 
um, and each one is numbered typically so that if there's an issue with the actual product, they know where to go back and fix that mold. So it's called a mold mark. These have all different types of mold marks, but they don't have a recycling number. It's almost got a cardboard-esque wrapping, right? Yeah. So it feels strange, but you're like, what is that? So there's lots of different other materials. It's not just solely polypropylene. It's got fillers and a whole bunch of other stuff. The top is number four. The bottom is number five. Uh, you know, and different, you know, different producers come out with different things. SunMed has a bunch of different ones, and some of them are these little gram ones. Um, and they have like a, a square thing on yes. the top you push down. Yep. Inside of the top, that's all polypropylene, but inside of the top is a weird other version of thermoplastic that isn't recyclable. So you have to come up with, there's all the tops are a little strange. Uh, Evermore, um, you know, Evermore, I love Evermore. Uh, they use a black, like uh, sort of, I don't know what, what kind of thing. Yes. Thing Yes, it's but you got to take the top off and stuff like that. Their material is number one, number one PETE, which is super recyclable in a general sense. Um, but it's black. And you go, oh, what the hell does that matter? Turns out, if it was just, and it's very small, if it was a little bit bigger, so if you got one of those big ones that's still out of the top, the MRFs could actually probably see it if it was white. But because the MRF uses a density, an infrared density, uh, it's like a laser beam. The black actually absorbs the the density, so it can't see it. So it can't all. see it, and it considers it trash and tosses it in the trash. It's these small, really, yeah, for sure. The small That's stuff like that is just really, really. That that doesn't irritating. surprise me only yeah. because you think about yeah, our yeah, business, no, and like you think you about like you every, think about, like nobody knows, knows yeah. that, right? Yeah. yeah. There's no pack. So Evermore didn't do that on purpose. They, you know, they got a packaging person. They made a big deal, yeah. and, and then black they, is sexy and black yeah. is cool. And, and you blah, tried blah, to blah. diversify, and it's a beautiful thing. But the second question is, what happens next? You know, what happens to that stuff? And for businesses, a lot of times, you know, they don't consider themselves owning that. Maybe not this business or any other business, but a lot of times that ownership is passed through to the consumer. And generally, that becomes a consumer problem. What do you do as a consumer? If with no place to put it, once you have all of the input, with no place to put it, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and that happens a lot. Like, you guys here in Salisbury, you're 100% right. You can't throw. Your uh, 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 curbside stuff at least tells you the truth. A lot of them will say they accept it. And, and, and just throw it away. Just, they, they're like, well, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, like I can't imagine like... To change, I'm, yeah, to change I'm, that communication is huge. Like I was going to say, I can't imagine. So the only things I'm not allowed to throw in my recycling bin are like the plastic bags if you have them. Sure. But other than that, they say everything can be recycled. And I just like, now after this, it's like, oh, okay. It's really good. Yeah, recycled. I mean, that's... Uh-oh, so that's Kyle, Kyle's yeah, going to be doing some reviews. Yeah. <laughs> don't let him listen to this I'm podcast. I'm telling my wife that, and she's going to be irate. <laughs> yeah, you can't... So why can't you... Th- you know why you can't throw the bags in, right? I should, but I don't. That's all right. So you imagine all these different things and these different gears and stuff like yep. that. The bag is LDPE. It's a really light, low-density polyethylene. I've seen the label on things before, LDPE. Right. It's number four, or three or four. It depends. But anyway, those bags come along the, the conveyors and stuff like that. They are also black sometimes uh, and all different colors, but they get floated. So to, to float stuff in one of these uh, places, they blow air and try to float the cardboard and stuff up, and then it gets caught by another thing, and it's really cool. Except those plastic bags stretch, and then they get caught in all the gears, and then they stop production on the entire line. So then they have to send an entire crew out to pull these things cut out, from, yeah. and cut it out and stuff like that. That's additional contamination because now you got the LDPE and the, you know, da, da, da. totally devalues their end product. You're trying to manufacture something here. That's a bad thing. And I think that's a part that a lot of people probably don't realize, and I probably didn't think about it. Is like the recycling plant itself. Like they're not just recycling. Like they're yeah. recycling for a product, right? They're recycling yeah. it and breaking it down to be reused into something else again. Sure. And yeah. that's something I think that at least it, it's missed on my behalf. I think it's when missed I think on a lot of people's it. behalf. Um, what it's supposed to do, what things that these guys and, and women and, 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 and counties have, have to, to face, the, int- the scale of it is, is mind-boggling. I mean, we're talking about 
So when we first started, one of the things was to make sure it was a sustainable sort of loop or diversion or whatever. To do that, you have to talk about how much material for your buyer. If it's not a buyer, I don't have a buyer or sure. a nonprofit, but the person behind you. So what is their expectation and how are you going to meet their parameter? Because they have a similar parameter to China. So how do you do that? Well, you really have to, to make sure that you can speak his language or her language. And they only buy in 40,000 pound increments. You know how much one of those things weighs? <laughs> yeah. Do the math. It's fu- if you just have those pop tops, you know, a 53, uh, 53 foot, you know, container on a truck. A shipping container? Six yeah. of them. You have to fill six of them with, with those pop tops. With pop tops. To be able to recycle to, them. To get them to take your phone call. <laughs> <laughs> So you have to, the scale now becomes how do you collect that much yeah. at the same time? So you have to, that's why the industry, uh, what you guys do and what you guys use as packaging, why it makes a difference, um, because you're 100% right. If it was split up and somebody was using, you know, half the team was using number ones and half the team's using number twos, it's not enough to recycle. So it's actually good. Big, it's actually good. It's bad that. It's a plastic pop top, but it's good that everyone's using the same one at least because we yeah, have the. It's a weird. Yeah. yeah. Once again, yeah. you, you learn these weird, very weird. Yeah, it's it's a dichot- super strange. Yeah. Di- it's it, a dichotomy. Yeah, 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 it's it, crazy. It, you don't know what to do with it. Is it good? You don't want to necessarily champion uh, plastic the use of production. Plastic, yeah. um, but so you're looking for you know our our nonprofit focuses on sustainable practices, um, and sustainable practices just means. Uh, and it's ours is specific for nature, but it just means that you know the people that come after you will have enough resources, and they'll have the resources that you have. Um, you know, and you try. You know, there's a uh, there's like a, a laundry thing called like seventh generation. I don't know if you ever heard of that stuff, mm-hmm. but that's off of a, an old school thought from a, a Native American tribe that they would set up every time they would make a big change to their environment or anything like that. It would set up a a meeting and somebody had to represent every generation down to the seventh generation so that to make sure that that person and the seventh generation had the same resources that you have now. Cool concept. It makes sense. No, it does. That's a stewardship, right? You have to take care of what you got. The biggest impact in my, if you want to call it social conscience or however it was, was just having kids, honestly. Sure. I mean, nothing made me look at wanting to protect the environment and the world the same way until yeah, a lot I of looked at like it for their kids. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm and sorry that I was so selfish before I had kids to be as, as, as concerned about some of the things, but it's uh, when you're forced to look through the eyes of, of someone coming after you and, and the ideas that this person is going to be here far after, hopefully I am. Um, I just want to make sure that, that their kids' kids, you sure. know, have the same thing. So I think it's it's awesome that um, it comes full circle into initiatives like this in terms of how – it's one thing to say that, okay, but how do you actually, you know, walk the walk? Well, I think it's when you have an opportunity and you have a business that's that has so much waste, you try to team up with someone like yourself, bring a program in, and, and launch it. So um, if uh, – if someone is listening, so, you know, kind of wrap this up. So if, if a patient's listening, um, kind of give them a little bit of a spiel. Maybe if you can rattle off some places on the other side of the bridge that, that they can go to. And then if a, you know, dispensary owner or a cultivar processor um, is listening, you know, how can they get in touch with you and set up a program of their own? Sure. So if you are a patient, the first thing to do is, is, is ask your dispensary. Uh, you know, they're, 83 think uh, all across the state close um, and they're all they're all in different sort of stages of understanding this learning about it and a lot of people may not know about it yet um, and certain ones uh, we can't get to yet and things like that uh, but the first thing is to know that using you know unfortunately throwing it in your blue bin isn't going to work so if you're one of those patients that has like a pile of them in your corner or in a bag or in a box somewhere you did the right thing. Just know that and wait, uh, and then go ask your dispensary. Can you become part of this, uh, you know, a, a participating uh, collection center? The dispensary owners, like you said, don't necessarily know um, that this is an issue that um, a lot of the bud tenders do, and a lot of people right on the on the, the front, front lines. Yeah. But a they lot of the ownership 
uh, isn't really sure that this is a, an issue for them uh, sometimes. Uh, it depends. So they like to hear um, the patients actually speak their voice, and, you know, they can. Um, but uh, there's places that you can take it uh, right now up on York Road, which is KIPP. Chessicana and Curio. I forget that they're all three within five miles Timonium. of each other. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of them. In, so if you're in Timonium, you're, you're the in the wheelhouse. You're in the Yeah, but there are a lot more that are about to come on where, you know, uh, like I said, we probably, try to, Probably the same boat as us is they, yeah. they've, they've made so the commitment. So there's and at a, at a point where everybody's got to get, yeah. you know, there's business stuff that has to be taken care of. There's commitments and expenses that people have to take it's coming, but mm. this is the only place that we have so far to be able to do it. I'm so happy to to be able to advocate for this moving forward and certainly be able to bring it up to other dispensary owners and other folks that we liaison with. Um, I'm, I'm really, really, um, I don't say proud of you, but I think it's, you know, to, to, to get this initiative off the ground, to, to get the regulatory support, to be able to put together such a really well-refined um, program and be able to give something that you can hand off to dispensaries, I think is, is truly amazing. And, um, you yeah, know, really applaud yourself for that. Thank you so much for coming down. I really appreciate you taking the time and, and explaining to us. Um, I learned a lot today. Yeah. I really did. I it was so. really, really interesting. And um, I really look forward yeah. to, uh, you know, to maybe have Having you on in a year or so when this is adopted in 50 or 75 percent of the Maryland programs is um I, I guess so. I will ask one last question I know that this is a Maryland centric program Currently. do you have eyes at PA or any of the new emerging programs there it really is you know you know our our, our program everything about it has been sort of born out of necessity uh, invented out of necessity there wasn't one there there wasn't one there and it was you know, the more there was a need, the more we had to make it more robust and more sustainable and be able to reach more people. We would certainly like to get into other states and be able to, you know, th that problem with the waste, with these MRFs, it f it's faced by every state throughout the, you know, I told you, 72% of the globe. So it's not just one thing, it's a big, big scale problem. So if we can help out in any way we can, um, you know, and, and figure out how to do that, we're certainly hopeful to do it. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Phil. I appreciate, appreciate it. it.